My topic today is, you know, multiple autoimmune syndrome. Um, we fell upon this topic while saying that, you know, I'm a physician, I'm a trained diabetologist, and now I'm training myself in endocrinology, and this would be my choice to talk upon today. So it was late in the 1950s where people started to talk about immunology as a specific branch. And there was this scientist who said, you know, that it was autoantibodies giving the autoimmune disorders. And in the late 1980s, there was this doctor called Dr. Newfold. He said, let us classify all of these autoimmune disorders and let us see when they are clubbed together or when they are happening together in a certain person, what happens. So I start with the case. Dr. Chavda has been very gracious enough in allowing me to present a patient of his. Uh, this was a 23-year-old lady, you know. She came to us uh, with signs of vitiligo. And she also had a pre-established uh, alopecia. And this was early in the uh, 2019. And she's a very routine patient, comes to us for normal phys physical assessment and all. And then suddenly one day she appeared at our doorstep with, you know, some abdominal pain and signs and symptoms of DKA. And uh, we identified it. We started her treatment for management of DKA. But then we started to do her full uh, metabolic workup. We did her antibodies. And then we found out that she's a type 1 diabetic. That is why, of course, that is why she landed up in a DKA like a situation. And she also had positive thyroid antibodies. Now, it so may happen that in spite of being, uh, you know, having normal thyroid function tests, she still had positive thyroid antibodies. And this is what we will be talking on today. So there is a common origin of autoimmune diseases. Um, there could be a co-occurrence of autoimmune diseases because of an individual or a familial predisposition. There are similarities in the pathological, pathophysiological mechanisms that underline these diseases when they occur together. And there could be a genetic proof or susceptibility in an autoimmune patient phenotypically because of environmental predisposition as well. So there are two terms now if you see over here. There is multiple autoimmune syndrome and there is something known as familial autoimmunity. So these autoimmune comorbidities that you are looking at at the big screen right now, I am focusing on the second, uh, third row of it with type 1 diabetes, uh, all autoimmune thyroid diseases, and along with it, there are some gastric autoimmune diseases as well, which we see in our patients with autoimmunicity. So this multiple autoimmune syndrome was a nomenclature which was uh, you know, defined in the 1980s as autoimmune polyglandular syndrome, when multiple endocrine glands were involved to portray out different uh, autoimmune disorders like the thyroid disorders, the pancreatic disorders, type 1 diabetes, celiac diseases, or ulcerative colitis, or vitiligo, candidiasis, ectopic dermatitis, even primary biliary uh, disorders. All of these were, you know, together termed as autoimmune polyglandular syndrome until the 1980s when it was this Dr. Newfold that I'm talking to you about came up and said that let us call it APS, autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome. And it is now that since the origin is not just endocrine system and it involves also gastric disorders and skin disorders that we call it multiple autoimmune syndrome. There might be an overlap syndrome as well with the person having at least two autoimmune diseases in the same patient. They can be overlapping with the connective tissue disorders or they can be overlapping with the liver disease. So now, how do we define this MAS? There could be a coexistence of more than equal to three autoimmune diseases in an individual person. There could be a dermatological autoimmune diseases. It should be a key, especially vitiligo, like I presented in the case. 25% of the patients with an autoimmune disease, they will tend to develop another autoimmune disease. And that is why we are here talking about multiple autoimmune syndrome. The pathogenesis could be environmentally triggered, like the cytomegalovirus, and all of us are talking about the post-COVID autoimmune onset of a lot of diseases and multiple autoantibodies could be present and it could lead to multiple organ reactive autoantibodies, which we are calling it as multiple autoimmune syndrome. So now this is a beautiful slide. This comes from the research center of Seattle. It's a very latest slide. And it talks about the genetic basis of MAS. And why are we talking about the genetic basis? Because these autoimmune uh, disorders are now in the process of 
you know, being prevented. The latest news, the latest FDA news is that a molecule called teplizumab has been, you know, uh, made useful in preventing the onset of type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune disorder. That is why it is pertinent for all of us to understand that there could be some sort of genetic predisposition for all the disorders that we regularly see in our OPDs. Rheumatoid arthritis or type 1 diabetes or multiple sclerosis, inflammatory bowel diseases as well as lupus. So when we talk about the history, the disease history, there it is defined that this immunity, autoimmunity iceberg is what it defines or how it describes the natural progression of an autoimmunity disease. So they, it could be in the potential phase, meaning that the lymphocytic infiltration and autoantibodies have not yet expressed or attacked the target organ, but the autoantibodies are positive and the person is still at a higher risk or susceptible at getting the autoimmune disease. The second is a subclinical phase, wherein the infiltration, the lymphocytic infiltration has happened. We have a subclinical format of the disease, and the person is showing some sort of symptoms or may or may not be showing them at all. And the clinical phase is an overtly manifestation of the disease altogether. So now when we talk about examples of this combination of MAs, the conditions may be present in either one of the format. It could be in the potential phase, it could be in the subclinical phase, it could be in a clinical phase. So if you look at these examples, it could be chronic thyroiditis or Graves' disease in the clinical format, along with another clinical overtly manifestation of an adrenalitis. It could also be along with a subclinical adrenocortical disorder. So all of us need to understand that the person might be manifesting the symptoms and signs or not, and you have to assess and screen uh, the patient for other autoimmune disorders. So now these again are some examples of all of these autoimmune diseases and majorly that we are observing in all our routine practices is type 1 diabetes along with some thyroid autoimmune diseases along with autoimmune gastritis, celiac disease and Addison's disease. The classification of multiple autoimmune syndrome is into four basic types, type 1 which has uh, you know, APECD, it, it started when a family in the Texas, the Whitaker family, you know, had a consanguineous or incestual uh, reproduction. And that is why, since this is an autosomal recessive format of MAS, uh, they could find mucocutinous infestation of candidiasis, hypoparathyroidism, along with Addison's disease. And that is the type 1. Type 2 is, again, very, uh, you know, rarely found. It is the Schmidt syndrome. It also has type 1 diabetes along with the autoimmune thyroid disorders. The type 3, which is very, uh, you know, very prevalent in comparison to the type 1 and type 2, has the thyrogastric syndrome. It has type 3A, 3B, 3C, and 3D. Uh, let's not go into, you know, all of the details, but it has endocrinological, gastrointestinal, the uh, skin, muscles, and nervous tissues involvement, and also SARDs. There is also another type 4, but maybe, you know, some other time. Possible combinations of type 2 MAS could be, again, subclinical format or a clinically overt manifestation of the disease. The subtypes of type 3, again, I have, you know, made a slide specifically on this or put it up because this is a more prevalent format and all of us are looking into thyroid disorders, specifically autoimmune thyroid disorders, very, very prevalently in our OPDs and we need to understand that we have to check these patients with thyroid disorders, autoimmune thyroid disorders, for all the other autoimmune manifestations or at least antibodies at some period of time or at least screen the patients for signs and symptoms for other autoimmune disorders. This is a very old paper of 2003, but it was quite interesting to understand that what is the most maximally prevalent, the first disease manifestation in patients with MAS. And the first is type 1 diabetes, second is the Graves disease, third Hashimoto's thyroiditis, Addison's disease, and then vitiligo. Uh, this is another slide which is talking about the most frequent combinations. Diabetes and thyroids are two frequent combinations of autoimmune disorders which need to be assessed and learned about in our people. Thyroid and adrenal score second, diabetes and vitiligo score third, and so on. Um, Another interesting thing to understand is that there could be a time interval of manifestation. Not all of the autoimmune disorders manifest at the same time. It could be one 
after a period of time, there could be the second autoimmune disorder, and so on and so forth. So this slide, again, from the same paper, is telling us that the most, uh, you know, the interval between two disorders from diabetes and thyroid, if you can appreciate the first bar, is 10 years. The least amount of time is between the development of thyroid, autoimmune thyroid disorder, and adrenal disorders, or adrenal uh, Addison's disease. All of these are very, very interesting to read, and this is a very old paper, but maybe we could, through the ACP, study more about that in the recent times. So now there are simple five Ws which we should follow, and I'm almost summarizing it. Why, what, who, when, and how. So the first W of why, we have to test antibody profiles, in, which is important for differential diagnosis, monitoring, as well as prognosis of these autoimmune diseases. Early diagnosis is important, especially in clinically incomplete form of these diseases. Who should we screen? Who should we, you know, identify MAS in? A case with one autoimmune disorder will also have the risk of having a second autoimmune disorder. And this is the person wherein you have to, you know, uh, try and detect or find out and screen for other signs and symptoms or autoantibodies. Index cases in MAS could be multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune thyroid disorders, type 1 diabetes, of course, IBD, and vitiligo. Even gastric uh, ulcerative colitis or celiac disease is some place wherein you could find out other autoimmune disorders. Uh, in these cases, again, it is important to understand that positive autoantibody may or may not be present and it ranges from 5% to 40%. Now, what should you check? There is a panel of autoantibodies to be measured and it is clearly independent and on the type and nature of the index autoimmune disorder that is occurring in this person. Automated, there are, uh, you know, multiple immunoassays that you can, you know, read or ask your laboratory to conduct. And we might not recall or remember all the autoantibodies for all the autoimmune disorders. But maybe we can go back, read our books, and, you know, come back with it. This is a simple table which I found for all these autoimmune diseases and some uh, autoantibody assays that could be performed. Now, when should you perform? So autoantibody positivity may precede the clinical diagnosis by several years, and it may not manifest into an overly, overtly clinical phase of the autoimmune disorder. Almost 5% of the patients who are affected by an index autoimmune disease may develop a second autoimmune disease even before or after the first, uh, you know, first disorder. A careful follow-up needs to be done of all of these patients, and it would suggest an autoantibody screening to be performed at least once in a year. So for our type 1 patients, we always say that you have to perform a thyroid autoantibody test at least once in their lifetime, a celiac autoantibody test once in three years. So a screening recommendation by the guidelines says that a requirement of high index suspicion of additional autoimmune, if you know all the types, you can conduct only those types of autoantibodies for those particular autoimmune disorders. Patients with MAS type 2, uh, this reads PAS because it was the older one, now it has to read MAS. And the first relatives with isolated Addison's disease or type 1 should periodically undergo screening for development of hypothyroidism in particular. Screening of these antibodies uh, may go against the thyroid uh, panel, but again, make sure that you are checking the signs and symptoms. Absence of the autoantibody does not exclude the disease. A positive serology may or may not be present in all the patients. Requirement for a long-term follow-up and observation is necessary. Now, where should you do it? This is a big question. All of us are physicians or diabetologists or, you know, work uh, primary care physicians and may not be working into setups where multidisciplinary help is, uh, you know, available. But it is important that we have the competence or referrals for multidisciplinary approach. You might need a gastroenterologist. You might need an endocrinologist. You might need an immunologist. And, of course, a physician is the basic pillar for all of this. We need to optimize the use of autoantibody detection test, and we need to provide proper counseling for the test results that come up. And we need to choose the optimum therapy for the type of MAS that comes up in these different uh, people. So the management and the key points, the management always depends on the type of index case or the index autoimmune disorder that is occurring in this particular patient. 
endocrine autoimmune diseases may have a privileged associations with other organ and non-organ specific autoimmune diseases in the context of MAS which we are talking about. And then there are four major types which we all read about. In patients with one clinical autoimmune disease, an antibody screening may discover other potential or subclinical formats of MAS. So with that, I'm going to thank you all for a patient listening. Thank you to the organizers and the chairpersons. Thank you.